Jordan Peterson. Welcome to New Zealand. I see you're wearing a lobster tie. It's a, a theme you carry with you everywhere these Apparently, days. Apparently, yes. <laughs> you won't or that be follows to, me around. It'll be on your gravestone, I guess, mm, one No day. doubt. Yeah. I wonder if I could start by asking you about The Handmaid's Tale. Uh, the series was uh, very big here. Both uh, series hit very big here uh, in the last couple of years. Um, the message, one of the messages of The Handmaid's Tale is that if you're going to stop the advance of feminism, you have to repress it. Do you agree with that? Do you think that's what that story's about? No, and I think Margaret Atwood had her come up and quite badly. She, she wrote that mm -hmm. Handmaid's Tale because she fell afoul of the radical left in Canada about a year ago and was taken out quite dramatically. And so, you know, the, your, the chickens tend to come home to roost. And I don't think there's any evidence at all that there's going to be a widespread movement to re-oppress women because I don't think that there's the desire to do that on the part of men, as far as I can tell. You, I mean, I certainly right, don't meet okay. men who want to do that. Do you, you, nevertheless, you've had quite a lot to say critically about feminism. I, I yes, wonder lots. You, yes. I wonder why you think the consequence of feminism really is worse for men uh, as well as for women than it's flowering. Well, I don't necessarily think the consequence of feminism per se is. I mean, the idea that now that we have the technological means to do so, which is primarily effective reproductive control, and that's only been the case since the 1960s, that the idea that we should open up the economic landscape to talented people of all types is only intelligent. And it's clearly the case that if you look worldwide and you look at the statistics that, that countries that have the more most advanced um, legislation with regards to the to the promotion of women r women's rights are also overwhelmingly the countries that are more likely to do well economically all of that makes perfect sense and we've done quite a remarkable and rapid job of roughly equalizing the number of women and men in that who are occupied in general and I think that's all to the good but the, the, the radical edges of the feminist doctrines are absolutely appalling in my estimation. They, they bear no academic water whatsoever. They're, they're, they're contemptible in their emphasis on um, insistence on collectivized, collectivized identity and, the, and also their insistence that the West is basically best viewed as an oppressive patriarchy, which is simply not true. So I've seen, I've seen a video of you saying that feminists, not radical feminists, but feminists, have an unconscious wish for brutal male domination. It doesn't quite square with what you just told me. Well, one of the things that I'm very curious about is the relative lack of, uh, the relative silence on the part of Western feminists about countries that truly are oppressive, like Saudi Arabia. It's not exactly answering yes, the question, so, though. Oh, it's exactly answering the question because I'm looking for the psychological reason why there would be much less reaction on the part of the ra radical feminists to countries that generally are oppressive of patriarchies instead of reacting the way they are to Western countries, which genuinely aren't. Right. So to be clear then, if the basic premise, premises of feminism are things like respect for everyone, the right to make choices, opportunities, safety for all, quality of life shouldn't be gendered. You presumably believe none of those things should be gendered. Um, well, it depends on what you mean by equality of life, because there's two different kinds of equality. I mean there's quality of life. Quality. Quality of life. Well, it would be good if it wasn't gendered or, or a consequence of race or a consequence of ethnicity or any of the things that are fundamentally irrelevant to progressive and productive movement through the world. I mean, any, any sort of discrimination that's mm -hmm. arbitrary, so that's not linked to the desired outcome with regards to an organization, is counterproductive, and I think that virtually every reasonable person already agrees on that. And, and the problem is, is that, you know, we tend to view any e inequality of outcome, any unequal distribution of the fruits of, of effort as, as indication of systemic oppression, and it's not. So that's just... Okay. Um, One of the things that strikes me about the world we live in now is that there are a lot of men who, have, who are struggling to work out where they fit in. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder whether one of the reasons for that is that most boys, as we grow up, we, we're given few mechanisms for dealing with being ignored or belittled or abused or being told we're wrong or, or just being left out. And we hanker for a world that treats us as we used to be treated as little boys. Do you think that is a fair summation of, of a part of the Western world today? Well, I, I think that men, boys, are actively discouraged 
And I think that that's a huge error and one that will eventually backfire on women to the degree that they're also attempting to develop masculine abilities. I think they're discouraged because the fundamental um, axiom of the radical leftists is that the West is an oppressive patriarchy and that all of the negative consequences of that are a consequence of, the, of men's actions. And if that's the case, then when you see young men attempting to manifest ambition or competitive ambition, that sort of thing, then it's very easy to punish that or at least not to encourage it. And that's not a good thing what for I'm anyone. What I'm asking you is that whether you think that men need help to learn what women have always had to learn, which is that you don't get preferred status just because you exist. No, I don't think men need help to learn that. I don't think that men have ever presumed that, and, and I don't think that we have had preferred status just because we exist. For men throughout the bulk of history, life has been extraordinarily brutal. Men have had by far the most dangerous jobs. They've gone to war. They've, they're, they're much less likely to be reproductively successful. There, there's, there, the idea that men have been preferentially treated as a group across history is an absurd idea. A small percentage of men have been more powerful than w men and women, but that is not the same as saying that there's been some gender, some global gender advantage that's characterized human and, interactions. And you don't accept that that, small, that advantage that happened to a small group of men was reflected right through society, right down into family groups, and, and you don't accept that it was... It's been reflected at each level. That men Certainly not at advantage. each level, no. I don't you think don't there's any think evidence that. whatsoever that that's the case. It's partly the evidence, for example, is that you have twice as many female relatives as you ancestors as male because the male reproductive success rate is half of that of right. women. So no, there is no evidence for that. And the idea that, you know, the, the best way to view history as, is as an oppressive struggle between men and women is an absolutely appalling way of viewing oh, human interactions. That's a jump from what I said. But let's, let's talk about order and chaos, uh, which is the theme, one of the big themes in, in your book. Mm -hmm. um, order is male, fate keep masculine, cha masculine mm -hmm. uh, and chaos is feminine. Mm -hmm. um, you quote approvingly the Taoist goal um, of walking the border mm -hmm. uh, between right, uh, right. chaos and, and order. Right. But you're not a Taoist, I think. But you've called your book 12 Rules for Life an Antidote to Chaos. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, it, it's a search for order. It's not a search for walking the border. Mm -hmm. and a search for rebalancing order, I would say. Would you say, rather than mm -hmm. simply a search for order and a rejection of chaos? No, it's definitely not a rejection of chaos. It's a rejection of excess chaos. It's an antidote to chaos, though. Mm -hmm. An mm -hmm. antidote to yeah, chaos. Yeah, well, right. because it is the matter of walking the line that's the relevant issue. So, yeah, okay. And the next book is called... Um, um, An antidote to order? I don't uh, think so. Well, it's, it's, it's called Beyond Order, Beyond 12 order. More Rules for Life. Okay. Order isn't harmony. Uh, order's a state of fear. It's not, order's not a state of affairs that's, by definition, beneficial to everyone. No. It's stability. Yes. Slave societies were ordered. Feudal societies were ordered. Yes. Um, but obviously a lot of people missed out. So I'm wondering whether you would think that if you had called the book How to Find a Balance Between Chaos and Order, if that had been the subtitle, whether it might have been a rather different book. Yes, it would have been a less successful book because it's a rather <laughs> awkward title. Okay. But, but no, I, I do think that the idea that what we're looking for right now is an antidote to chaos is correct because a lot of people are nihilistic and depressed and they don't have an aim and they don't have a place and they don't know where they're going. And that's not a good thing. I don't think that what we're suffering from in the West right now is an excess of order. That isn't my, that isn't my observation, although that can happen. So you've observed, uh, rightly in my view, that, that societies use hierarchies or are hierarchical. It's a mm -hmm. um, reasonable thing to observe, I think. But I wonder whether there, society is also about cooperation, that it's about striking the balance, that social progress is about how we find and refine and develop that balance. Classical society, for mm -hmm. example, a classical Greek society would have found democracy inconceivable without slaves. Mm -hmm. uh, well, well, a function, functioning hierarchy is yeah. also predicated on on cooperation. Like there's no reason exactly. to assume yeah. it's a it's a neo-Marxist postmodern presumption that the basis of hierarchical competition is power. It's not something okay. I believe. So neo-Marxist postmodern I mean mm -hmm. it's a label you can you can throw at 
anything that criticizes you because it can mean anything to anybody. Um, no, it fundamentally means that the basis of hierarchical structures are power, and I don't buy that. And that is the fundamental claim, and it's the fundamental claim well, of the Marxists, and it is the fundamental claim of the postmodernists, and I, it's I, simply not I, true. I, I, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole of what Marxism might have to say to postmodernism and vice mm -hmm. versa, because I'm sure you'll agree it's a, it's a rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. um, but I w did want to ask you, Given that society evolves, I've mentioned mm -hmm. from ancient Greece and, and so on before, um, why is it useful not to go back to that and look at how society's evolved? In your book you go back to lobsters a third of a billion years ago mm -hmm. and that's the basis on which you, make your, you stake your claim uh, that we need to be understanding the role of hierarchies rather than looking at the balance between hierarchy and cooperation? Well, we need to go, go back to the fundamental biochemistry because we need to understand how important a role our own perceptions of our hierarchical position is in our emotional regulation. So, we're, like you, you have a mechanism that's unbelievably ancient and deep, very embedded inside your psychophysiology that marks where you are in a given hierarchy and it determines how much negative emotion and how much positive emotion you feel and it's not under voluntary control it's one of the fundamental control mechanisms of the brain and the reason I made the case that it was a third of a billion years old was to try to indicate just exactly how widespread and powerful this mechanism is and it helps understand for example why people are so um, hurt by, by status reduction, because they definitely and are. And it also marks a difference between you and a, a lot of others, I, I would guess, that, that y you would say that, that that's defining, that uh, if it's a third of a billion years old, it's hardwired, it, 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 as you've just explained. Uh, others would say that actually, as humans, we have developed cooperative so social mechanisms that take us far beyond that, and it is far more valuable to look at how we evolve together uh, than to go back to the idea that actually we are simply crustaceans at heart. Or well, <laughs> we, we, we we've certainly we've certainly determined how to structure our hierarchy so that cooperation plays a much larger role in them than they do in most animals. But that doesn't mean that that's altered our fundamental the fundamental way that our biochemistry interacts with hierarchy. And so the, the idea, the critics of especially the first chapter of my book didn't read it because I wasn't justifying okay. hierarchies. I was attempting to point out that we're very sensitive to hierarchical position and that the best way to occupy a position in a hierarchy, to move up and to occupy a proper position, is to play a careful reciprocal social game and not to use power. So. Yes, you, you do argue that, yes. Mm -hmm. Could we talk for a moment about Me Too? You've rejected the idea that we should always believe the victim in a, in a, in a rape Well, that's uh, obvious. That's yes. what happened in uh, the Lynch cases in the 1950s in the United States. The uh, victim uh, was uh, always uh, believed. Yes, and I was going to say that's fair enough. But why not accept the situation as being the victim deserves to be treated as if she's telling the truth in our attempts to get at the truth and in doing that, we do our best not to re-victimize her. Because that isn't how the adversarial system works, and I don't think But that why not advocate for that? Because Rather the adversarial system is a very effective judicial system, and it's certainly the case that among crimes that are falsely reported, rape crimes are at the top of the list. So there is no believing the victim. There's no reason for people to assume that when they enter the criminal justice system that they're going to be treated with kid gloves or treated easily. That but, isn't how it we works. We also know that we have a major social issue in this country, especially domestic violence is a really big issue. Most mm -hmm. police call-outs in this country are, are to do with what they call domestic harm. Yes. It's mm -hmm. not an issue that we're going to resolve through the traditional adversarial approach of the courts and having victims no, understand be, they're going to be re -victimized. Most of that would be best addressed by um, dealing with alcoholism because most of the cause of domestic violence is alcohol related. It's, it's strongly related. Mm -hmm. that, yes, and right. so we're yes. not looking at the proper causes. But it's not just look, looking at alcoholism. It's 50% it. right of violent crimes okay. are a consequence mm -hmm. of alcohol intoxication. So it's a huge contributor. Yeah, of course, how the police behave, how the courts behave is mm -hmm. surely also part of that. Uh, perhaps. Um, Okay. I, I wonder whether this is an example of something else that people criticise you for, that in talking about Me Too and talking about mm. victims uh, and allegations of rape and so on, mm. you've moved the debate to an extreme. There are false accusations. But that's not a very useful, is that a very useful place really to, to have the argument? I don't think I have moved the debate there. What I've done mostly is to tell men that they should act honourably in relationship to their sexual relationships with women. And I'm quite a traditionalist yeah. in that manner. And so I think that the best way to regulate sexual behavior in general is to, 
is to return to or to value long-term committed monogamous relationships yes. and that's basically the fundamental solution. And you have argued that. No, I, I mm -hmm. And, and it has very that. little to do with Me Too and I haven't commented much about Me Too but in general. When you, but when you do and when you have, there's a subtext which is a completely different message that you send to people. It sends signals that women are liars, that men's sexual behaviour isn't offensive, is never offensive, that it's a plot. Those messages are carried as well, subtexts. I don't, I, what, what evidence do you have well, that that's the sort of thing that I've put forward? I've said almost nothing about Me Too, except for the danger of believing the victim automatically, well, and then, that's uh, obviously a danger. Well, so I have nothing against the Me Too movement, apart from the fact that it has the proclivity to go too far, like most like spontaneous mob movements. Yes, but defining it as the movement that goes too far is a doing movement that. movement that goes too far. Yes, but that's why, why settle on that as, a, as the definition of the Me Too movement I rather haven't. than something. Well, okay. I asked Twitter uh, about you, and mm -hmm. this is one of the things Twitter said. Peterson is a, a man telling men to be good people responsible for selves and behaviour. Yep, that's sorely needed. Peterson gives volition back to those who've succumbed to victimhood. Mm -hmm. And I think you'd agree with that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we'd all say that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, but what I wonder reading the book 12 Rules uh, for Life is where's respect? The book is a me Bible. I, I can't think of another book of its kind, a self-help book or a, or a religious book for that matter, that doesn't include as one of its rules, respect for other people. You haven't done that, and I assume it's deliberate. Um, I don't think that that's true in the least. I mean, one of the things that distinguishes my work, say, from the work of someone like Ayn Rand, is that I make the case consider continually that there's no such thing as atomized individuality. And so, for, for example, if you're going to treat yourself properly, which you should, you have to treat yourself as an iterated process across time properly. So you today, you tomorrow, you next week, you next month, you when you're old. You're already a community if you're going to treat yourself properly. And if you treat yourself properly, you're going to take into account your family and you're also going to take into account your community all simultaneously. But the right place to start is with the things that were are within your local control, and there's some humility in that. It's, it certainly has nothing to do with instantaneous self-gratification or you, selfishness. You must have been aware it was an unusual thing to do, though, to not make that point more clearly. The, the other thing that's missing is, is service. Uh, most similar books to yours would, would find a way to say in their list of 12 things, or whatever the list was, would, would include a way that was explicitly about service. You say it late in the book, um, when you're looking, listing a, a list of principles for living by, you say, what shall I do with the poor man's plight? Strive through right example to lift his broken heart. What that says is you don't help him, but you show him what a better person you are so that he'll want to copy you. No, you show him what a better person is, not what a better person well, you it's are. You, well, it's the same thing, isn't it? You, you, not necessarily. Uh, strive through right you example. You, 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 you're saying right example in your own personal life. I'm better than you and you need to be like me. No, that you're an example of something that's better. And, and I don't, for example, when I'm lecturing, assume that I'm better than the people that I'm lecturing to, which is part of the reason why people respond positively to my lectures. I assume that we all have plenty to learn. And the rule five, for example, in my book, which is about raising children, is all about service. And so is rule six, which is to clean up your room before you criticize the world. And so the idea that the book is somehow a pan to individual, individualism in the same way that, say, Ayn Rand's philosophy is, is just completely in, inappropriate. It's you don't not think the it case. Could be, you don't think it could be read that way? I think Clearly it can not. be read in all sorts okay. of ways, but that's certainly not the aim of it. You've called yourself a, tradi a traditionalist uh, and a conservative in the sense of being aware of my own ignorance, and you've quoted your Hippocratic oath, first do no harm. You make a lot of people very upset, and I wonder whether I make a small minority of very noisy it, okay. people very upset, <laughs> I wonder but whether I you make figure. a lot of people very happy, right, and I, I would say that's like 95% of people. You don't accept the charge then that, that you, um, although you are an advocate for more order, that you're actually fermenting chaos, that you're quite deliberately fermenting chaos by... by I'm certainly not deliberately fomenting it, because I don't enjoy deliberately fomenting chaos, and if that's a consequence of what I'm saying, well, that's how it goes, but in it's every, not, there's nothing deliberate about that. In every interview I've seen you give, and I've watched a lot of them, 
you never say there's something in that or you're partly right or maybe I went a little far. You, you, you never make any of the conciliatory statements that most people might make if, if they were trying to reach towards agreement with people for a way forward. Well, it depends very much on the interview. Like if you watch my interviews with Joe Rogan, if you watch the YouTube videos that, have, that are long yes. form, it's always the case that there's a conciliatory discussion. It's just that the traditional media forms, which tend to be more adversarial, don't allow for that sort of dialogue. Oh, that's an interesting way to put it as the interviewee. Um, social, you're a social scientist. You, you know the world is filled with a thousand shades of grey. You know, but the tenor of what you say consistently is that it's black and white. It seems very unscientific to me. Um, I need an example before I can respond to that. Well, you don't think the book is full of those examples? That, the world that are is black like and this? white? Word, you know, you Not particularly. Yeah. Okay. I, I think there are terrible shades of grey that that, that torment people when I'm asking people, for example, to take stock of their own lives. What that is, is a matter of taking a look at what's grey about their lives and trying to divide it into what needs to be sorted out and fixed and what needs to be maintained. And there's grey everywhere and, and, and the idea that you need to walk the line between order and chaos is certainly not a description of a world in which there are simple black and white um, rules because the, that line is something that changes that's, that's and shifts absolutely all right, the time. That's absolutely right, but I, I don't read your book as a walking the line. I read your book as a let's return to order. Uh, then I think you should read it more carefully. <laughs> okay. You uh, said uh, last year on NBC News in Toronto that diversity, inclusivity, equity, all of those things together make up a very toxic brew. Mm -hmm. a Especially equity. Okay. There's a shock tactic going on in there. And uh, sometimes it's not that you will claw it back, but many of your followers will say, he didn't say that. You have to insist on the context. He might have been misquoted. But I wonder whether... I wasn't misquoted. No, okay, so that's the quote. But I wonder whether there's a clear message buried in that, not really even buried in, in that statement, which is that the values of the modern world are terrible and we have to go to war on them. No, there's a message that there's something extraordinarily dangerous about the combination of the mantra of diversity, inclusivity and equity, especially equity because it concentrates on equality of outcome. And equality of outcome is a, it's a, it's a failed endeavor in every possible manner, philosophically, practically, historically. Um, it's been a complete disaster and that's because it's a logical impossibility and a and a practical nightmare. It's also pretty easy to argue that that's a straw man argument, that, that actually we do believe in equality of opportunity, we do accept that a society has a range I, of I wasn't talking about and equality of outcome, of, uh, opportunity, I was talking I, about equality I of know. outcome. That's what I'm saying, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm suggesting that painting society as being fixated on equality of outcome doesn't actually accord with what, what we And I, I don't think for. society is fixated on it. I think a small minority okay. of very noisy people are fixated on it to the detriment of everyone else. There was a it's, it's a completely untenable goal. And there was a process that happened uh, recently with Alec Manassian, who was that, the terrible case of the, the man in Toronto who drove into, yes. uh, your, in your hometown, drove into a crowd of people, killed mm -hmm. many people. Mm -hmm. um, you tweeted, uh, I'm sorry, there was a tweet about you that, that suggested, could casu you, it was your tweet, could casual sex necessitate state tyranny? Mm -hmm. and the missing responsibility has to be enforced somehow. Mm -hmm. And then that became interpreted as Jordan Peterson believes in enforced monogamy. That was interpreted by a New York journalist That's who knew right. perfectly That's, well yes. that that wasn't what I meant. Exactly. And then that was interpreted mm -hmm. as monogamy should be promoted as the norm. Which well, of course, it is and should which be. Is, which is what happens now, of course. It mm -hmm. is, it and is in most cultures yeah. around the world. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Yeah, what so, I meant was so it's not a big statement to make, is it? No, it's, not it's, at all. Yeah, and what yeah. I meant was that if people didn't take individual responsibility for their own sexual propriety, that what would happen would be that there would be totalitarian intervention in the, by the state in order to replace the missing morality. You That's also, all I meant. You also told Joe Rogan, if you're a young, because you wanted to clarify what you meant, mm -hmm. if you're a young man and all the women are rejecting you, then who's got the problem? It's not all the women. Mm -hmm. That's a very bad road to go down. Yes, that's and for sure. I imagine a lot of people would have been very happy to hear you say that. Mm -hmm. I've said it repeatedly. Indeed. I mean, I've talked to men continually about right. the fact that so they need to grow up and accept uh, Over a six-month process, mm -hmm. we had that series of statements from you. Speaking clearly is one of your 12 rules. Mm -hmm. And I wonder why it is that in a situation like that and in many other situations, what actually happens is that you sow confusion. 
Mm, I don't sow confusion. The journalists that interview me sow confusion. Well, the woman think, who wrote the New York Times article. Why do you think that happens, article. that, oh, that for you her, get misinterpreted in your views so oh, often? With her, it was absolutely clear. I spent two days with her, and we spent 30 seconds talking about enforced monogamy, and she's this very smart woman, and she knew exactly what I meant and chose to make that the centerpiece of the article for, for I would just say, to attract attention in a way that was completely inappropriate. But you know it's not just the journalist from the New York Times. You know that this happens over and over and over. That's because the journalists read each other's journalism okay, and they don't so, read the so books the fault, and the they fault don't is watch not what I'm saying. Never with you. The fault well, is, no, the yeah. fault is sometimes with me. Okay, I mean, it's not right. like I, every, I always say everything perfectly. But there's, there's no, it's, I mean, it's getting dull to read the journalistic accounts because they're just mirror images of everything that's been written over the last year and a half. And the same old things. There's 10 epithets that are generally thrown at me, every one that you can possibly think of. And people have gone over everything I've said to my students for the last 30 years, almost all of which is recorded, and found absolutely no evidence for any of that, even once. I would say that there is a lot online of, of journalists actually trying to interview ser use, uh, seriously, trying to get towards a, a proper understanding. And that what you just said to me is a, is a very common thing you say. You, I've been over the evidence, there is no evidence anywhere. It's it isn't easy, just me that's been over well, the evidence, it's, it's an people easy thing that have been, take, yeah. been, it, been trying to take yeah. me out who've been over the evidence and have not been able to find any. Last year you said, uh, asked what you would say to Justin Trudeau, your Prime Minister, and you mm -hmm. said, you thought for a while and you said dividing people into their tribal groups can do nothing but bear evil fruit in the long time, in mm -hmm. the long run. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that isn't a very good example of the assumption that the world was properly organised before when really it's always been in tribes, always been in classes and in gender groups and in races and the organisation of the world in that way has always borne evil fruit. Mm -hmm. And I wonder in addition to that, whether you recognize that you are one of the world's leaders of identity politics. Uh, no, I don't think you don't, I'm one. You don't, I don't accept believe that? that? I don't believe you don't that believe that's you true are a champion for an identity group? What would be the identity group? Uh, white men. No, I think that that's an appalling accusation. And I think if you go to my talks, for example, that there's no evidence that that's the case. And it's certainly, you certainly have no evidence that that's my readership. And even if it was the case that the predominant people that I'm talking to are men between the ages of 25 and 35. That doesn't make me an identity politician, and those people need to be talked to too. Why does that not make you an identity politician? Those people because I'm not be inviting them. To. I'm not specifically. arguing they shouldn't be talked to. I'm just I'm just wondering why you would say that you weren't an intellectual leader for for that group of people and many others. Because I'm not I, I'm not inviting them specifically to what I'm doing. That's just how it's turned out. And the part of the reason for that is because the YouTube. YouTube viewership is 80% male across the board. Mm. That has nothing to do with me. There's a women's bookshop called the Women's Bookshop oh. in this city. I'm allowed in there. It's, it's not an exclusive thing. It's, you wouldn't want to argue that a women's bookshop calling itself that wasn't explicitly feminist because of course True. it is. But yeah. I don't call my book something that's specifically devoted mm. to men and the vast yeah. majority of my students throughout my academic career have been women at least 80% of them. And well, certainly it's a, a very large proportion of women that are, that are reading and buying the book. This so this is just a trope that journalists use. Your audience is primarily angry young white men. It's like, okay, fine, I've talked to about 350,000 people yeah. in the last year and there hasn't been one incident, one in untoward incident of any sort by any single one of the people who've come to my talks. And that's 350,000 okay. people. So where's the aggression? Yeah, you see, what you've just done there, you took what I said and took it to an extreme. I didn't talk about angry, I just said white men. Uh, I accept that the angry side is a very small corner, yeah. but okay. You've got a message that leftist academics, student activists, transsexuals, corporate HR departments are following the what you call the postmodern neo-Marxist uh, theories. Uh, that will, I think you would argue they just, they're going to destroy Western civilization. I wonder why it has to sound like a plot rather than the great contest of ideas that we enjoy in Well, in it is in part a plot. I mean, many of the d disciplines in the universities, especially the women's studies disciplines, are activist disciplines. And they're actively they designed to promote they're ex it actively designed to, to, to promote and to train people to move into organizations and to advance these doctrines. And they're, they're, it's part of the ideological structure of what they're doing. 
is does to that, change the world and not to understand it. Does that and make, to it, a, it, make it a way. You can criticize the left for things like an, uh, an intolerance of diverse views, relativism, blindness to tyranny. All those things stick to the left, mm. but they also stick to the right. True. They stick to everybody. Mm. They, aren't they just part of the slow, muddy march of history? Why are you so obsessed about demonizing a particular part of that muddy march? I don't think I am obsessed about demonizing it. I think I'm obsessed about calling out what's happening in the universities because what's happening in the universities is appalling. And so I think the humanities are very rapidly being destroyed. I don't think there'll be a man left in the humanities in 10 years at the current rate, which I don't think is a good thing. And I think that we're in danger of losing exactly what the humanities were always, um, what would you say, valuable for, which is a continuation of a certain kind of conversation that's been enlightening people for perhaps 5,000 years. And so I think it's an absolute catastrophe that it's disappearing. One of so. the, one of the uh, things you're famous for saying is that you found it difficult to debate with uh, certain types of women. Uh, mm. because the normal rec things you would have recourse to uh, if you were debating men are not available to you. And what you meant there was you couldn't hit her. No, I didn't uh, mean that. I you meant didn't that mean that? You meant, well, what no, did you, I tell didn't me what mean, you mean that at all. Tell me, tell I me meant what you meant. It's, it's, um, it's known among men that there are limits to the manner in which you can interact and that those limits don't necessarily apply when you're dealing with women, especially women of a certain sort. And there's no way of regulating that, and that's a big problem. That's right. what I meant, uh, and I think that it's true. It's obvious a lot of women uh, were surprised to hear that. and I would oh, have happy as well. I would have thought a lot of men were surprised to hear that, because I, my experience is that men don't generally uh, engage in their interactions on the basis of suppressing their anger, which is what you're really getting at. They don't engage in their interactions on the basis of, I've got to moderate... No, they, and they regulate their behavior so that that anger isn't necessary. Yes. Why You strike me as angry, and I wonder why you're angry. Um, I guess I'm not sure why I strike you as angry. You don't feel angry? At the moment? Mm. Not well, particularly. Well, okay, generally? No, I wouldn't say so. Wouldn't I'm, say I so. mean, most of the places that I go, look, I can tell you what my life is like. You can tell me if you think this would be a life that would make you angry. Okay, everywhere I go, I'm stopped by people, at least a dozen times a day, I would say five times an hour. They're often young men, but not always. Almost all of them are exceptionally polite when they approach me. They'd like to have a picture, they'd like to talk to me, and they'd like to tell me why their life is substantially better since they've encountered my work. And I've gone to, I don't know, a dozen countries, maybe more, 15 countries, and talked to at least 10,000 people who've told me that story over and over. And so you imagine what your life would be like if everywhere you went, what people did was come up to you and thank you because what they did helped you not commit suicide and get out of your addiction and stop being alcoholic and take responsibility for your life and try to put your family together and that things are much, much better and that they're often in tears. It's not something that makes you angry. It's something that makes you hurt. It's not making you angry now? It's hurt. It's hurtful to see how much need there is for that in society and how unfortunate it is that people need such a small amount of encouragement to lift themselves out of those sorts of, pl of places of hell. And it is, it's, it is irritating to me, I would say, that men in particular, young men, have been discouraged to the point where that's such a common occurrence, when they need so little encouragement to move forward in a productive and progressive direction. I, I accept that. What surprises me is that the context of it is a context in which the me is stressed uh, and the more traditional questions of how you fit in, how you, de how you, how you cope with an evolving society rather than being able to uh, encouraging people to stand back and go, actually the encouraging, the, 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 the way society is evolving is wrong and we can step back from it and we can stop it. It seems mm -hmm. to me there's a nostalgia you that you're offering upon, people you there. You insist upon this idea that the me's at the center of this. So I talked to a young man a month ago who had stopped his heroin addiction about a year ago and it was as a consequence of watching my lectures and he said he's had 12 of his friends do the same thing and I insist continually that if you're treating yourself properly you're doing it in a way that also benefits your family and also benefits the community. There's a strong communitarian ethos in there and it, it has nothing to do no. with a what would you call it, okay. a, 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 a focused individualism. 